Hey guys, Stephanie here with the Aeroponic Tower Channel and today we are going to discuss the thing you guys ask me the most and that is where to buy seeds, what kind of seeds to buy and do we need organic, non-GMO, um, what does it mean to be a hybrid versus an heirloom? So we're gonna dive in and talk about all of those things today. So go ahead and grab a cup of coffee, maybe grab a pen and a notebook if you wanna write down specific things. And I will put links to all of these seed companies in the description below. Now, I often get the question for links to specific seeds um, varieties, so like Mabuna. And I'm going to equip you guys on how to find seeds um, more so than giving you direct links to every single thing that I mention. And the reason is seed companies change. I just got all my new catalogs, not all of them have come yet, some of these are from the spring. But my new catalogs from seed companies just came in and seed companies change. Sometimes they don't get a good harvest of something they had last season and so that falls off the catalog. So links aren't going to equip you guys because those things can change. So I really want to address like the overall education of seeds so you can make the decision on which ones you feel comfortable buying. I'll mention my favorite companies and why they're my favorite companies and some of the things I get from those companies and how to go through a seed catalog or a website and choose the right things to grow on your tower garden. I'm gonna be talking a lot about indoor gardening today because my towers are indoors. So a lot of the things, we're gonna go through my actual seed order. They are for this season in my growing. So I grow in this garage for four months out of the year. And this is indoor gardening. So there are specific ones for outdoor gardening if you wanna go back and watch some of those previous videos just to see some of the things I grow outside versus inside. But the main topic we're gonna to cover today is seeds in general. So an overview with seeds. Uh, there are heirloom, hybrids, organic, non-GMO, and just regular seeds that don't have anything on them. And I wanna address what all of these are so it'll help you make your decision. Not all the seed companies that I order from are certified organic. Certified organic uh, doesn't always mean that that's the best company. There are companies out there that aren't certified organic just because they don't wanna go through some of the uh, requirements or the cost to be organic, but actually have higher standards than organic seed companies. And there are some very generic organic seed companies. Like you can go to Walmart and buy organic seeds. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend buying any of your seeds at the big box companies or under a lot of the big, um, more commercial names. That's just me personally. I find these smaller companies that are really invested in quality seeds, care so much about seeds and have such a passion for seeds. And those are the companies that I trust and the ones I'll be sharing with you today. So when we're talking about heirloom seeds, heirloom means that it's true to its natural state. So it hasn't been bred, let's say a tomato. It hasn't been bred with another tomato to have different characteristics, but it doesn't mean it was never changed. Heirloom only goes back some 50 years, some 100 years, and then some you can find like are a thousand years old and haven't been changed. And I'll talk about that when we get to my favorite heirloom company. But just know when it says heirloom, it doesn't mean it's like never been crossbred. It just means it's been, it hasn't been for many, many years. And how old those seeds are, again, 50 years to 100 is kind of the standard. But then there are some that are much, much older that you can find. So that's heirloom, just means it hasn't been changed. When we're talking about hybrids, it means that they are have been crossbred to get characteristics in a plant, specific things like dwarf tomatoes, for example. They took maybe an heirloom tomato and bred it with a hybrid tomato, and they're trying to create that heirloom type shape of tomato, but in a smaller plant, so they're easier to grow, or in a plant that's more disease resistant. So they will crossbreed these things to create different varieties of food that meet the specific criteria that they're going for. Usually it's easier to manage, less disease, tastier food, those kind of things. They're good 
goals and it doesn't mean that they're genetically modified it just means that we have taken two different varieties with something to try and create a new variety now when you're dealing with hybrids you have open pollinated and that would be where it's stable so if i were to take two tomatoes and pollinate them together to create a new tomato that i thought would be a nice tomato if i then gave you those seeds to grow when that tomato produces and you try to grow the seeds again to get the same variety of tomato that i bred it's probably not going to some of the seeds may give you the exact tomato that I bred and some may not because it's not stabilized yet. So when we're talking about open pollinated, it means that that hybrid has been stabilized. So if you were to want to save seeds from that plant, as long as it wasn't cross pollinated by something else and contaminated, then you would get the same variety of the seed package you purchased. So it's stable. Uh, when they're talking about F1, that's what it means. It means it's been stabilized for like one generation those are hybrids they're not gmos now genetically modified i've done some research on this and i, I land somewhere in the gray and i don't fully understand it category um it seems most genetically modified seeds you would need to purchase from like specifically saying that they're genetically modified because they're you're purchasing them with the intent of spraying them with roundup or getting whatever goal you have with that genetic modification of that plant. I don't believe a lot of the seeds on the market are genetically modified. There's actually only a few vegetables that are GMO at this point, and I can put a link to those in the description below. Now that's changing pretty quickly, so it's going to be outdated pretty quickly. But when we're taught when we're buying seeds they're not typically, we don't really have to worry as much about them being genetically modified from my understanding because most people buying genetically modified seeds are buying, they are looking for them to be labeled genetically modified. Zucchini, for example, is a GMO crop. So with zucchini, the way I sort of navigate this to stay safe is when I know it's a genetic crop a genetically modified crop i just buy organic or heirloom and make sure i know where those seeds come from and that they're not gmo but again there's mixed information out there some people say you can't buy gmo seeds because they don't produce seeds but from what i believe there can be cross contamination from seeds so you can have a gmo crop that is pollinated into a regular crop and then that can change the genes of the regular crop so Again, I'm not an expert on the GMO. I avoid, I just am careful with the list that I'll put in the description below of the things that are genetically modified at this point, And I make sure to buy heirloom or organic with those things. So with organic, obviously I think organic is the best because then we don't have to worry about the GMO and all of those things or anything being sprayed on them. But like I mentioned before, I have seen quality, I, I we have amazing quality companies here and some of them aren't certified organic and i've seen organic seeds at like walmart and i wouldn't personally find those to be quality seeds so there is a balance with that um organic we don't have to worry about the chemicals if there, if there was some sort of synthetic chemical or pesticides pesticide sprayed on the mother plant we don't have to worry about those chemicals transferring into the seeds and then into our food but I do think those chemicals and synthetic materials that are being used can alter the DNA of plants. And you know, when we eat those plants can alter our DNA a little bit. So we want to have high quality standards with seeds, but I don't always feel like the highest quality comes from organic, if that makes sense. Um, so again, I go back to just the companies I trust and I trust them by doing my research, reading up on the companies, looking at their growing standards. What do they believe? You know, are these people who are passionate about seeds and food or is this just a big box company that's buying seeds from anybody? Cause that's, you know, they're seed buyers and how you know a, a company is a quality company. They are going to, they don't grow all their own seeds. They're outsourcing from quality growers who have really high standards. So I guess that's the difference. Like, do, does the company really invest in their growers and know who their growers are and care about those things? Or are they just 
buying seeds from any source because they're a big box company that's selling seeds and they don't really care. They just need organic radish seeds. So they throw it in a package in their own branding and sell it at the Walmart. Those would be the differences. So let's dive into some of these companies. And I want to show you how to choose seeds, your own seeds for tower gardening so that you can go through the catalogs and, you know, branch out. I grow specific things based on what we like to eat and that changes. What I grow today may be different next year. It kind of just kind of depends. I kind of ebb and flow with things we like to eat and grow and find fun. So equipping you guys to be able to pick out your own seeds is the goal. So with seed catalogs, if you want catalogs, you can go to the seed companies and request them on their website. Most of them are free. I did pay for one. I buy one every year. That is absolutely amazing. It's my favorite book to have to just peruse throughout the year. Uh, but the rest just come and once you get on the list, like I don't have to get on there twice, um, they just send me catalogs every year, which is really nice. And they usually come, we are in December, so they've started arriving this month. So I'll be getting catalogs. This is pretty early. I will get them through January. So I don't have an exhaustive list here, but these are some of my favorites. And then there's two companies I'm gonna mention that I don't have catalogs for that are awesome as well. And let's just dive right in. So on here, well, this is the Mountain Rose Herbs catalog. This is not a seed company, but if you need dried herbs and things, that's a great company. The Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. I got this one locally. This is their 22, 2022 one. I have not bought from them, but I really did like this catalog and they are passionate about seeds and the quality of seeds. So I definitely wanted to mention it. It's Southern Exposure Seed Exchange. So I am going to get online and request a new catalog for them. I picked this up from a local friend and they've got great books in here, Growing Companions in the back. These catalogs to me are really important to read if you want to be a better gardener. If you really want to master growing your own food and taking back control of the food you have access to and the better than organic, healthiest food we can grow, I highly recommend just taking some time to read the different varieties. So sometimes I'll look and just interested, let's say in zucchini, and I'll go through the different varieties that they have in here because you'll start to create a database of the different types. Not all zucchini is the same. If you like grocery store zucchini, you want to get something like a market more. But here's a Costata Romanesca zucchini. It's actually one of my favorite. And I know the characteristics of that one because I grow it, but I can also read on here. It's an Italian heirloom zucchini, is favored for flavor. Fruits remain tender even at 18 inches. And that is absolutely what you'll hear me say about this is that you can let it get larger and it's not seedy and it's not um, zucchini can get kind of weird if it gets too big it doesn't do that it actually has very few seeds and holds a great texture as a large zucchini um, what else does it say best picked at 12 inches so now you know more information on when to pick it so fruits are striped with alternating light and green shades so you know what it looks like you have an idea what it tastes like and the texture so i enjoy reading the catalogs and recommend that if you want to be a better gardener because it will just open your mind to the possibility of how much food is out there the grocery store is such a small portion of the foods that are available and actually we have lost so many seeds just over the years like our there's a documentary called seeds if you want to watch that it's really good i'll put a link below and um, just talking about how we have really lost a lot of seeds over the years and we can start to expand that and so i really love seed companies and catalogs because it opens my mind to just things I didn't even know existed that I want to add to our diets. So Southern Seed Exchange, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange, Johnny Seeds. This is last year's, I believe. Yeah, this is the 2023 catalog. They have not sent me a new one yet. Johnny's, I buy a couple of things from. I don't source too many things from them, mainly because they're pretty expensive and they tend to be more for the larger market farmer like a farmer they sell things in bulk so i find their choices 
are good. But again, a little bit more expensive, not as interesting of choices as some of the other companies, just kind of okay. What I do get from Johnny Seeds is their Salanova lettuce. Their Salanova lettuce is three, it has three times, I think, it has, I think it has three times the amount of leaves of a regular, regular lettuce. Um, I'll put that a different number up. If I'm not correct on that number, I'll put it up here. But it's basically a lettuce that's really popular in market gardening. And it grows into these giant bouquets of baby greens. But they're not baby greens, it's a mature lettuce. And why that's great is because when you cut it, they all fall off and you have this giant bowl of baby greens, but you're getting the mature flavor of a mature plant and the texture of a mature plant. Baby greens tend to be softer. They tend to have a more mild flavor because they are the baby version of a large lettuce. This isn't the case. These are full grown lettuce heads that just happen to have small leaves and a lot of them. So you can get these gigantic bouquets of small leaves. So I really like Salanova. I've got many growing on my towers right now and they are the only source that has the Salanova variety. They have quite a few varieties of them. I thought I would pull up one of my favorite. I have a CrossFit, hopefully not broken finger that is quite uncomfortable right now and making it hard to turn pages, but I wanna go through. Oh, here we go. Okay, so they have a whole chapter. It's worth the catalog just for these lettuce. I, I do recommend, the, again, these lettuce seeds are more expensive, but we also have the advantage when we're growing on a tower. I have all these seeds around me that I'm trying to use up and I'm starting my seed collection over because I was a soil gardener and I needed to buy tons of seeds because even though, even if I started them in, the garage ahead of time they don't always transfer out and then i would sow in a lot of seeds to try and grow produce outside and there was a big very large seed waste component to growing in the soil for me for the whole you know many many years that i've been growing in the soil you just use a lot of seeds and you get a little bit of food out of them where on a tower i would say our germination fail rate is you know there is a germination fail rate on towers and with any seed starting set up, I say it's about 80% success when you're starting in rock wool, but then we can reuse the rock wool and we're only adding one seed, sometimes four seeds if we want a bouquet of something. And those that one seed becomes the one plant most of the time. So our seed loss is very, way better in a tower garden experience than it ever was for me personally in a soil garden because I didn't have a greenhouse when I was growing in the soil and didn't have a super um, large seedling setup because you need to be able to start a lot of seeds if you're growing in the soil because you typically are growing like all your beets at one time. We're not doing this consistent turnover in this interval planting. So there was just a lot of seeds and a lot of seed loss because I didn't have a proper greenhouse and way to start those seeds. So on the towers, I don't have that. You know, one seed typically becomes one plant. And if for some reason that doesn't germinate, I just add another seed and get that one to germinate. So there's very little seed loss. So I personally don't mind spending a little bit more on my favorite varieties of food. So their Salanova, they have a green incised, amazing. They have the sweet crisp, also amazing. Salanova incised, um, they have a red incised, a red sweet crisp, a red tango. There's butter. So you get the little butter leaves, which are so amazing. They have a red butter, oak leaf in red and green, and a bativa, and a bativa, a bat, bat, batavia, a batavia. I think that's how you say it in both red and green. So great options. Highly recommend the Salanova. The other thing I often get from true from Johnny's is their mini romaine. They have a dragon, a breen, and a truscus. I like the mini romaine because, and we're going to talk about this when we 
talk about how to choose your seeds, but a regular romaine can take 80 days to mature and a mini romaine can take 45. So I like to choose the mini romaine because they're available faster and it keeps the turnover going on my tower a lot faster. And I can harvest, harvest two mini romaine, which is the same as which is the same amount of food as a large romaine, but I can get those two to grow in one grow port together and a lot faster. So I often do that and get my mini romaine from Johnny's. I also get mini romaine from another company, but if I happen to be ordering at Johnny's just to save on shipping, I will add a few things like that. So True Seed, this is local to where I am in Asheville. I don't buy a whole lot from them, sometimes at our local uh, health food store in town if I just need like I'm ran out of a seed for some reason Doesn't happen very often last year. I ran out of yellow squash somehow um, I can just go down there and grab them. They carry these great company. I've been to their store So great company. I just haven't purchased a whole lot from them because their seed selection is not as interesting to me as some of the other companies. So I tend to migrate to the ones that have really interesting things that I find fun to grow. Park seed, you'll hear, you'll hear me mention park seed quite a bit. I really like park seed. This is their spring 2023 catalog. They have not sent me the new one yet. I'm excited to get that, but in park seed, you're gonna see a lot of flowers and just a lot of standard type foods that seeds, um, seed varieties that you would find in a lot of the other catalogs. Like Kentucky Blue is very common. That's a green bean. But they also have some unique varieties that I really like. And they carry the dwarf or container size or bush, whatever you wanna call them, cucumbers that I think are so enjoyable to grow on a tower because I don't have to fuss with large cucumber plants. I've mentioned cucumbers in the past. So that's what got me turned on to Park Seed was specifically their cucumber selection of container size or bush varieties is really, really good. They also carry the patio baby eggplant, which you guys have heard me talk about quite a bit, unless you're new here and then welcome. Patio baby is a small variety of eggplant and highly prolific and it's a small plant that produces up to 50 eggplant per plant which is a tremendous amount of food so i really like park seed i will get other things from park seed like they have this de purple cauliflower i've purchased that before in the past but mostly from park seed i'm looking for the small varieties of cucumbers and the patio baby eggplant now, here is one of the tips I want to chat with you about on how to read these catalogs and find the best options for a tower. If I'm on here, I have, let's see, Early Spring Burpless Hybrid is a cucumber. It's crisp, mild, bitter-free, and burpless bites all season long, firm and easy to peel. The fruit reaches eight to 12 inches long. It takes 52 days for this one to produce. So that is going to be, when it says all season long, that means it's a big vining plant. These are long cucumbers. This is a long plant. It's going to produce fruit, grow more vines. Some of the vines will die. Some of the leaves will get brown and icky. New ones will grow and it'll carry on as long as it has somewhere to go. And then it'll burn out when the weather changes. Where if I look on the other page, I've got a pick a bushel hybrid. And a pick a bushel hybrid is tops for containers. That's what it says in the beginning. Compact semi bush plant sets up to 20 white spined cukes, sweet and crisp, Harvest at three inches for gherkins. You can harvest for harvest at three inches for a gherkin cucumber or six inches for a fresh slicing. So the difference there is one said it's great for containers. That tells me this is a small plant that is not going to take over my house. You're not going to be able to grow a big, large vining cucumber in your house, not conveniently anyway, because it'll grow outside the lights and just make a giant mess. So a container variety I can grow in my house. It's going to be small. This only produces 20 white spined cukes. I often see um, some missed expectations when it comes to growing food because you can grow a lettuce for six months on your tower and it can look beautiful 
it'll hit a peak and then it'll start to decline and you can you can do that you guys know if you've been here a while that i say get it off when it's mature and replant a new one in there we shouldn't be leaving our food in there for six months because that means we're not eating it we could have many turnovers of lettuce in a six month period of time rather than just eating a few leaves off of a lettuce plant in six months and yes those leaves will grow back but not at the quantity you could be consuming if you just took the plant out and put another one in but with a cucumber it's not the same so some people grow cucumbers and then wonder why they're getting crispy and the leaves aren't looking great well this plant is going to grow and it's going to produce 20 i find it to be more like 12 fruit on it and all the energy as it starts to produce that fruit is going to go into those 20 cucumbers and the leaves are going to start to look kind of icky and dry up and die and fall off or need to be removed because all the energy is going into making that fruit and then it's done so we need to be timing our cucumber so that we can start another plant so i just look at the cucumber as like when it starts blooming i make sure i have another seed started and ready to go into the tower because that one's going to bloom pretty fast i'm going to get my harvest of cucumbers and i'm going to need to replace that plant that is the goal especially if you're growing cucumbers in the house this is a fast turnover crop it's going to do its thing and then it's done so we can't look at our cucumber and there be discoloring and think oh it's not getting enough light i'm on some facebook groups and i'll see things like oh it's not getting enough light or your ph isn't right i will tell you i check my ph like never i haven't even checked it since i've been in this garage i don't think it's all that important unless you have some water issues and you're having a really hard time because your ph is really really high or really really low and you kind of gotta have to learn um how to add your nutrients to balance that but once like i know what to add to my tanks and very rarely do i even check the ph it's usually when i notice there's a little discoloration in a plant that i'll check it and be like oh it just got thrown off somehow usually it's because i forgot to put both um minerals in or just got heavy handed because uh, you guys have probably seen i'm not super accurate when i add my nutrients but again even not being accurate and not checking it's very rare that ph is ever a problem for me personally when i'm growing on the towers whether it's indoor or out it's just most issues that are happening that i see uh, people putting in their starts when they're too young uh, harvesting too much off of their starts, especially when they're young, you only want to harvest about a third of the plant at a time or you can start to stress it and then it grows really slowly or people leave their food and their towers way too long, which can cause a lot of problems as well. Main one being that you're not eating enough of your produce and we want to be eating our produce really quickly and turning it over. Uh, but food is going to reach a peak and then it's going to start to decline. So we want ideally to get it right when it's at that peak, right? But I say, especially when growing indoors, I eat a lot of my food a little bit younger, especially right now because everything is a little bit younger and I'm going to keep eating off my towers every day. I'm not gonna wait for my cabbage to get full grown. I will eat one that's halfway grown and have food for dinner and put another plant in there until my interval cycle catches up to this garage because we kind of had to transition and a lot of things were young at the same time. Um, I will grow fast things like baby greens because those are the kind of things that are going to grow super fast and give me food while I'm waiting on the cabbage to get larger. So we, but I often see People will eat off their food or it looks really pretty and they'll kind of dabble in eating off of it and then it reaches its peak and then it starts to go on the decline and then people want to know why are their lettuce leaves turning brown on the edges? Are their tomato leaves turning brown? Things like that. It's because the plant's dying and it's not intended to live forever and it's on the decline. So just knowing about your cucumbers and the expectations of that cucumber is so much of the battle being won right there because now i know i'm expecting to get if it says 20 like i've said i typically get about 12 off of that plant it's one of my favorite to grow pick a bushel hybrid and then it's gone and i'm just going to start over i'm not worried about if the plant looks terrible i'm worried about it giving me those fruit and then moving on to the next one so reading these super super helpful another one on here 
Let's see if I can find. Patio Snacker, I grow this one a lot. 55 days to maturity, produces compact, high yielding plants that work well in containers, small garden spaces, that's our keywords, especially for growing indoors. Harvest the dark green fruit when they are six to seven inches long and enjoy a crunchy, flavorful treat. Sometimes your fruit will be smaller when you're growing indoors. We're using artificial light, we're using artificial air. I guess it's not artificial air. We don't have outdoor airflow. We don't have rain, which has nitrogen in it that's landing on our plants. Things grow a little bit slower, a little bit smaller. So just know that's the expectation. But again, it had those keywords. I'm looking for small, container. I'm looking for short days to maturity. If it says 90 days, and I've got another one right next to it that says 50 days, I'm going for the 50 days because I want my food to turn over quickly when I'm growing on a tower. So that's cucumbers. Same with eggplant. The Patio Baby eggplant matures in 45 days. It's a charming dwarf plant, dwarf being a good keyword to look for, with lavender blooms and 50 mini eggplants in a season. I can vouch that that's true. These are so prolific. But underneath it, I've got one that is an icicle variety of eggplant and it takes 75 days to mature. So even though it's a smaller eggplant too, it's not one of those giant, an icicle eggplant, it's a smaller eggplant, it's not a giant eggplant, it still takes a really long time to mature. So I'm not even going to attempt that inside. Actually, if you wanna grow eggplant, the only one I really recommend is the patio baby if you're growing indoors. Outside, I'll branch out. I will plant three patio baby and then a couple black beauty, which are a larger eggplant, and I planted some fingerlings to have variety to have more options. But if you only had one tower and you were growing outside, I would say stick with something that produces quickly so you can get more food. If you've got three, then maybe you can branch out and taper them and have some of the smaller growing, some of the slower, longer growing varieties, and then put a couple of baby, patio baby eggplant in the mix so that you can be eating eggplant while you're waiting for the others to mature. That's always a good option. So that is Park Seed Company, great seeds. Because I like the cucumbers and um, the Patio Baby, I often get their mini romaine. I will just peruse and find fun things too that look interesting when I'm on here. They also have things like cannellini beans, which I'm gonna be growing this year outside. Uh, so I'll just look for different, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see that. I mark it up and I take notes and then I write these things in my journal when I do purchase them. So all the seeds I've purchased go in my journal so I know what I'm growing and the success of them. Great, great company. This is Jung Seeds and Plants. I have never purchased from them. I'm not familiar with them at all. Somehow I got in their radar. But what I was really interested in from this company was, oh, these are mostly trees and fruits. I do uh, mini fruit trees and I grow a lot of our berries around the property. So yeah, this is for outdoor permaculture kind of things. Gardening, Jung Seeds and Plants. Family owned and operated for 117 years. And I just got on their website one day and got really interested in some things for my permaculture landscaping. So that's what this is. They do have some regular produce it looks like, but again, I haven't purchased from them yeah they do have regular produce as well so definitely plan to spend some time in this catalog and i will keep you guys posted this one is so fun this is totally tomato so some of you have said i've referenced this before and you couldn't find micro dwarf tomatoes and that's because the words people use from catalog to catalog and company to company are not always the same so we're looking for container varieties bush varieties, patio varieties, um, dwarf, micro dwarf, did I say container, patio? Words like that hanging basket, that's another one. These are words that are being used, so they're not always going to be the same. So I can go on a website and write, put in dwarf and find nothing, but then later realize that that company has a whole variety of amazing small plants that grow well 
and containers and that are just small plants they just worded it a little bit differently so a lot of times what i'll do is go in and i'll run filters so you can go into chudley tomato for example and go to the tomatoes and then filter down and they're going to word there's hanging baskets and i think the other term they use is container varieties i'm not sure but they're not using the word micro dwarf even though we call these micro dwarf tomatoes because they're really small so just be mindful of that you may have to filter and dig and look for small container plants and use some other terms to find exactly what you're looking for. So totally tomato is absolutely amazing. Their variety of small tomatoes just blows my mind. Everything I'm growing in this garage this winter is from totally tomato. And I'm not going to go through my list on this video. I have 12 varieties growing, but what you'll see is in here lots of photos and so when we're talking about micro dwarfs and containers we've got these containers right and we can see what the fruit looks like and we can read about each one <clears throat> i wanted to read one specifically to you because not all micro dwarfs are for quality of food there are a couple tom thumb and orange hat are really common in the aeroponic world because they grow on a tower and they're small and they're easy to grow. They have very little flavor to me and the texture is not great on the fruit. I grew an orange hat this year and outside it had more flavor than it did inside. So it had good flavor, but the skin was thick and it's just not one I'm gonna grow in the future because I have so many other varieties that are amazing. So when you are growing, looking for foods that have been bred to be smaller, just make sure you're also paying attention to the quality and texture. And we do that by reading about the plants. We read our catalogs, read the websites. So these Heartbreaker Hybrid Collection is one that they have. These mature in 70 to 85 days. Um, it's got some different varieties. Their juicy fruits have tender skins. That's what's our clue word. We want tender skins. Perfect sugar to acid ratio, which is important with tomatoes. A bricks of nine. Sturdy plants have nicely branched trusses of fruit that lay outside of the foliage for easy visibility and harvest. Great indoors, on windowsills, there's our keywords, in small gardens, raised beds or containers and hanging baskets. Plants are excellent, bigger, and naturally remain dwarf without any pinching or pruning. They produce abundantly and are a determinate tomato. Determinate means they just have a determined number of produce. And then you can get fruit that it's gonna set. Then you can go through in each one and kind of learn like, what are your expectations with this plant? The Dora clusters, um, clusters of approximately eight to 10, weigh up to half an ounce each. These are the bundles of tomatoes it's gonna produce at one time. Each are about the size of a quarter, bred for regrowth after harvest of the first fruits. So that what that means is that you're gonna be able to go pick your fruit off and then it's gonna send out more fruit and it's gonna to continue to fruit until it's reached its determined amount of fruit that's in the genetics of that plant. Um, but do you wanna, and it says, but as long as you're harvesting the ripe fruit, it'll keep producing fruit. So that tells me the nature of that. That tells me I'm going to be able to intervally eat off of this plant. And so I can harvest a little bit each day, depending on how many plants I have or each week. And I have access to tomatoes for a while. Eventually this is going to burn out. You're going to want to plant another seed with these. Uh, one of you guys on here in the comments said you could cut them back and they regrow. And I'm doing that on a couple as an experiment to see. I personally think starting new seeds is the better option for a couple of reasons. Less, it's gonna use less um, nutrients and waters when you're starting from a young seedling that's gonna grow really fast versus a more mature root system. But I am growing some that were growing outside and just running some experiments on that and they are growing back. So I'll keep you guys posted on how that works out. And if I change my mind, maybe cutting them and letting them regrow is faster than starting new seeds. I don't know, I'll keep you guys posted. Uh, so yeah, reading about your tomatoes. It'll tell you everything you need to know about these varieties. I love orange tomatoes. So I can go in and then what I do is create a mixture of different textures, colors, and sizes so that we have a variety. I love to 
um, kind of like those mixes of tomatoes you can buy at the grocery store. You can all the different colors and shapes. I think that's a really fun way to have food available on the table. Now with these at a micro dwarf, you're not going to get a slicer tomato. There are some Roma tomato varieties that are micro dwarfs are smaller. But if you want a slicer tomato, you'd have to move into the next category of a dwarf. And you can grow dwarf tomatoes inside. That is definitely an option. With the dwarf tomatoes, they're gonna be bigger. They can get as tall as four feet. And it's going to be a much slower process. So something like these cherry tomatoes and grape tomatoes, these smaller micro varieties are going to give you consistently are consistently going to give you little bits of harvest so that you have tomatoes every day or every few days, depending on how many plants you have. Where a dwarf, you're gonna wait. It's going to produce some fruit. It's going to take a really long time. And then you'll have a little interval process with a dwarf tomato that's producing a slicer. They don't all come in at the same time. So you will have a little interval process, but it's going to be a much longer process than a micro dwarf experience. So just know that if you have one tower and you absolutely love slicer tomatoes that are homegrown and you don't want to have them from the grocery store, <coughs> then it may be worth it. If you want to not have to buy tomatoes weekly and you love cherry tomatoes, get the micro dwarfs, the hanging basket dwarfs, container varieties, whatever we want to call them. This company has so many on here. It just blows my mind and they're all fabulous. So that is Totally Tomato. Again, I will put links to these in the description below. And this is my favorite company. Totally Tomato and Baker Creek are my favorite. This is their free catalog. You should definitely get on their list. Their catalogs are absolutely gorgeous. Their seed packets are really gorgeous. This to me is super exciting. I, I talk a lot on here how seed starting is my favorite activity because it gives me so much hope and excitement for the foods we're going to have and just inspiration. It's, it's like going to a farmer's market and filling up your basket with all of that goodness and just that feeling of knowing you're going to be making all those healthy choices and I love that experience and their seed packets really feed that experience for me because they are so visually stimulating and I can see the food, see what it's going to look like and kind of get and really get excited about that. Their catalog's the same and they do a good job of adding recipes and a lot of background information. Now the Baker Creek is an heirloom only company. So when you go here, you don't have to worry about GMOs. You don't have to worry if it's organic. These are heirloom varieties and they're amazing growers they and so when i go here um what we're looking for is the same thing days to maturity let's say for example i want to grow so this cut their catalog also does a really good job of explaining where the seeds came from. Let's see if we can read one. Uh, here's something. This is a strawberry spinach. I was interested in growing this. Native to the moist mountain valleys of North America, but also popular in Europe, dating back to the 1600s. Plants are fascinating. The arrow-shaped leaves remind us that it is a relative of spinach and the flavor and nutritional profile are reminiscent of spinach as well. Perhaps it's the most intriguing quality. Um, perhaps its most intriguing quality is its small but bright red berries. Allow the berries to fully ripen to deep crimson for juicy sweet flavor. So we get a lot of details. They do a great job of explaining like where did this plant come from? How long has it been around? It just makes growing food so much more interesting to me when I know that information. So this is their smaller catalog that's free. They also have the whole seed catalog. This one is $15, $14.95. I buy it every year. I keep all of them. I love them. I read them like a book. In here, you've got a few things. Um, we've got an order sheet if you want to fill that out. I've never done that. They've got flowers. Everything that they offer is in here. And you're going to have recipes. So here's pansy glass cookies. Like how amazing are those, right? I'm going to grow some 
pansies on my tower indoors now just to make these flour cookies. So we've got different recipes and just lots and lots of information. The pictures are absolutely stunning. So it's really fun to spend some time just reading through and learning about plants and different varieties of plants. Now when we're in a catalog like this, what I'm looking for is a few specific things. Like I mentioned, let's go to the cabbage section. I mean, look at all this food. Look at the cauliflower. Oh, speaking of cauliflower, we have to talk about one more thing. Um, okay, so here's cabbage. Right, and so when I'm choosing my cabbage, especially when you're growing indoors, we don't want to have the expectation of growing a head of cabbage. That's a long, slow process, and you're gonna need the real sun and the real elements outside for that to produce. But I can grow a ton of cabbage indoors, and I do all the time. I just plant four to six seeds and let them grow as like bouquets of lettuce, and I eat them the same way. They have the same nutritional content. So when I'm going through a catalog like this, I'm looking to alternate things like that. We've got our Nagasaki, and we've got our Golden Beauty. You guys will see me grow this a lot. Grows amazing. This one grows slower than this one. So I kind of taper when I'm growing those. So I'm looking to find things that grow really quickly, but then I can also taper in some things that are really interesting to me that may grow a little bit slower. I just won't grow as many of the slow things as I do the fast things, just because we get to turn them over faster, obviously. But there's large leaf cabbages and all sorts of things, and I have some in here, so we'll go through those when we get to that point. So again, we're looking for small varieties, things that mature fast. If you are looking for romaine lettuce, read through the descriptions, decide which one has the flavor profiles you like, and then look at the days to maturity because some romaine can take 90 days and some can take 60. We definitely want to go with the 60. Cabbage is the same. Some can take 105 days and some can take 65 days. Those are typically with cabbage, they'll call them early, middle, and late season. And early means it's going to be ready to eat it's going to grow faster and be ready earlier in the season so those are the kind of clues we're looking for when we're shopping in our catalogs oh, to make sure that we buy the right things for our towers so before we move on to what i purchased here's another example i was going through the totally tomatoes in the bath because that's my favorite thing to do in the winter um and the cool thing about growing on a tower is I don't, most people have to wait and they kind of daydream over these catalogs all winter, planning for the spring and then they have to do all their work and all that time and, and they have to do all that work at one time, grow those things all at one time and then they're kind of done until the next season. When we're tower gardening, we don't have to do that. I can daydream about these things and actually order the seeds and plant them and grow them and eat them all year round, which is so cool to me. But let's see. <clears throat> so when I was perusing this catalog, I came across, man, they have a lot of tomatoes. And peppers. They don't have a full catalog of everything. If you want tons of different varieties of tomatoes and Peppers, they definitely have those. There's some cucumbers, eggplants. Here we go. Cauliflower. So I love cauliflower. It's one of my favorite foods. They have a variety over here that caught my eye that I'm going to be growing. It's baby hybrid cauliflower. It produces, here I'll just read it to you. It produces in 28 days. First off, 28 days is so fast. Most cauliflower is 60 days, 60 to 70 days. This one below, it's 68 days. Cauliflower takes a long time. It's, it just does. It takes time to grow the leaves and then for the head to form, it takes a while. I've got some outside that are producing right now and they have nice size heads, but I still need another week, maybe even two for some of them to get that really big grocery store type cauliflower. This 28 days. So this is one that I can grow indoors because it's gonna grow so fast. And the smallest and cutest cauliflower available on the market. Each plant produces a small, compact, two to three inch head. And as an added bonus, the leaves are edible. Uh, all cauliflower leaves are edible. 
I think that's just a selling fact factor that they're giving you because the heads are so small. Now I'm going to totally do this because I think having a little bit of cauliflower to add to a meal really expands and diversifies what we're adding to our plates. If I have baby greens, for example, and I have some tomatoes and I'm able to harvest a pepper and a cauliflower and an eggplant, that's a wide variety of foods that I don't have to buy at the grocery store. That really gives us a lot of diversity instead of just a bunch of greens. So I'm gonna be growing these cauliflower. So those are the, the keywords I'm looking for. Small container, fast growing. All right, let's dive into these seeds. Oh, so this is just Baker Creek. I have not ordered from Totally Tomato yet or Park Seed. Um, I probably won't be ordering from Park Seed because I still have plenty of seeds. I did a big order from them early in the spring, in the fall, but I will be ordering a big totally tomato option soon. So I'm going to put these back in the bag as we go through them because I'm reorganizing. We're on homeschool break as of Tuesday, so I'm super excited to knock out some projects. All right, in dive. This is a curly endive. I love endive. Endive is a green, but it's uh, hardier, easier, denser. Like if you like super crisp and crunchy greens, the flavor's a little stronger, but it's definitely a crisper. If you don't like super soft lettuce, endive is a great option. Grows amazing. Mustards. I did this Unzin Koba. Just looked like a really cool mustard. It's got this, I don't know if you guys can see this. It's got this stem that you can cut and eat it almost like, to me, it looks like um, a broccoli stem. And that, I chose this one because that's a meatier addition to a meal when you can add something that has a little bit more texture. I just really thought that was cool because it's a mustard green. We can juice the tops, but then we get that food component, that chewing component of something a little bit heartier in the stem. So I thought those were really neat. And that's another thing I'm looking for is diversifying the colors of our foods, the textures of our foods, and then we can pair them together to make large meals out of all of this stuff we're growing. Turnips, I thought this one was interesting. It's a purple turnip. Nagasaki Akari Kabu. Um, purple is always good for you. Anthocyanins in it, which is a superfood, super antioxidant. Chinese narrow leaf. This is a bolt resisting, fast growing romaine that is very popular in China, especially in cooked recipes. Use the young leaves raw in a salad like a classic romaine or allow the leaves to grow larger and add to cooked dishes like stir fries. So it doesn't look like a traditional romaine. So this is a little bit different to eat it as baby greens. So I'm doing a few as small greens to eat it like it said, like romaine lettuce. And then I'm gonna let some get large to do as cooked greens for our stir fry. Buckwheat, okay. I grew buckwheat outdoors. Um, in the past. I just wanted to experiment with this. Someone asked me if you could grow buckwheat and yes, you can because I can say that with confidence because I grew buckwheat in the soil for many years and I understand how it grows and what it's like. Um, I don't know if you can grow it indoors, so I'll keep you posted, but I just thought I would give that one a try and it's so gorgeous. So pretty. Lettuce Chadwick's Romaine. This is just a variegated red and green romaine. I am working on some spinach. So spinach is one of those crops that most people, a lot of people will ask me, can you grow spinach? Because they're used to buying spinach at the grocery store. And spinach takes a lot of seeds to grow a little bit of food. So I often say it's not worth it because the amount of food you get for the amount of seeds and the amount of time just isn't that great, especially when growing indoors. It tends to want to bolt under artificial lighting. And there's better options. There's other healthier foods like mabuna that you can eat instead. But 
There's also a place for spinach as well. So I'm going to be running some experiments and I'll keep you guys posted. I want to do a whole series on spinach and I'm really trying to master varieties that we can grow on the tower. So what I did was chose really large leaf varieties or varieties that were known for being more abundant and the amount of food they produce. One of them I read produced like 25 inches worth of lettuce off of one seed. That's what you're going for. A lot of times you can plant one seed and get like five lettuce leaves from that one seed. So these baby green lettuce, or not lettuce, these baby green spinach, you can plant one seed and get like five spinach leaves off of just one, which isn't much food. So when you're getting that baby spinach, they're planting, you know, I've done it before in my raised beds, planting hundreds of seeds and then chopping it to get those baby green, those baby spinach leaves. So I'm working on some varieties that are just a little bit more abundant to see if we can get those to work. I think this is the one that said it has a 25 inch span. I'm not sure. It's in the catalog if you want to read up on it. But those, the, all the spinach you'll see me share today, I'm running experiments on, and I chose because of their leaf size or their abundance. Uh, Snow White bok choy. Again, going for the texture here. I like the stem that gives us a little bit of green on top, but then we have these long stems that we can do different things with to jazz up food. You'll constantly see this balance of texture. So we're not just growing greens we can grow different kinds of greens that offer different flavor profiles different health benefits and different textures um, i'm going to try these cabbage i haven't decided if i'm going to do them inside this has a pretty long cycle 85 days so i believe so i don't think i'm going to grow these until the spring but i just wanted to give them a try they look fun turnips i like white turnips you guys see me grow you guys see me grow a lot of turnips, so that's just restocking. The Chinese Beauty, I've talked about this before, and I have lots of videos where I've harvested this in my reels. It looks like it's going bad because most plants that turn yellow are going bad, but it's just the nature. It grows up and it's green, and then when it's mature, it has this golden yellow center, and it's super delicious. Love that one. Uh, this is Granat. I grew this and love this. This is just another Chinese cabbage. I like this one because it grows really tall and narrow and tall and narrow is a great companion on your tower with things that are bushy and full. So if you've got a bushy full tomato over here and maybe a bushy full pepper on this side in between the two on the bottom grow ports, let's say you had a tomato a bushy tomato here and a bushy pepper here the grow port underneath it you can put something like a granat that's going to grow up in between those two and not get in the way and shade things out so long narrow foods i often buy those just for that sake um they give you free seeds when you buy spend so much i don't know how much it is but basil seeds i need I actually need to start some basil okay this is more spinach this is a gigante something something. It's a giant of winter, produces large, broad, deep green leaves well into the fall months. This one, like I said before, spinach, I was going for abundance or huge leaves. Molokia, giant of Bertroa. No clue. I'm not familiar with this one. 45 to 60 days, so that's fast. A tasty, versatile, and extremely heat tolerant leafy green of the Middle East and Africa. Tall, upright, plant will grow up to 10 feet. One of the tastiest tropical spinach substitutes. Okay, so that's why I bought it. I didn't buy it to get 10 feet. Just because something says it'll get 10 feet, especially in the greens family, you can see that is clearly not 10 feet in the pot. It just means it can if left outside. So I got this as a spinach replacement to try. Because uh, again, we're trying to master spinach and find replacements for spinach because that's a common question I get. So I'll let you guys know. I'm excited about that. I like different things that I haven't tried. Uh, Caserta. This is a zucchini that grows smaller. Um, Cocazelle varieties, which I mentioned before. I really like varieties that have low seed and good texture. This is one of them. And the fruit are smaller. So I wanted to try these indoors 
because again indoors we want we don't want to wait for a 12 inch zucchini if we can get one that's ready in six inches that's a better option for growing indoors cilantro i always buy the slow bolt which just means it goes to seed slower. Cilantro is known to go to seed very quickly. It definitely doesn't go to seed very quickly indoors, not as quickly as it does outside, but any kind of heat forces it to go to seed. So I always buy the slow bolt, great variety. King of the bitters, this one's really fun. This is an annual, it's in the herb family. Um, Eastern medicine. It's a medicinal plant. Reaches 36 inches tall. Small purple pink flowers. Uh, super heat and sun loving. It's cold sensitive. This one matures in 160 days. This is a little bit different. You can grow this more as a perennial if you have the right climate in your tower. You wouldn't have to take this out you wouldn't want to cut it back and let it regrow. You would just harvest off of this one as like a come again type plant. I'm going to grow it more as the baby greens version or a small plant and harvest it and then start over. So I will keep you guys posted, but this is medicinal. Actually, all plants are medicinal on some level, but that one's just known for some specific medicinal things. What is this? Uh, turnips. Oh, I did some red turnips. I just wanted to branch out from the white and try some reds and purples because color is nutrition with food. Bok choy, that leads right into that color is nutrition. Uh, purple is always amazing to grow purple foods because you get those anthocyanins. So I grow a lot of purple food. With this variety, you can plant one seed and get one bok choy. I find three are ideal. Three seeds per rock wool with this one. They're, they're only about the size of my hand, so three does a really good job. You can grow three in the Baby Greens extension kit, uh, and they don't take up much space. You guys hear me speak of this one all the time. Chijimusai, I grow a ton of that. More free lettuce. Looks like some sort of romaine. Uticule. Uticule? It's an ancient variety. Istanbul turkey recognized for arc of taste as a beloved culinary symbol of the Istanbul's century old urban gardens. It's a romaine and you can see what romaine used to look like. Looks very different than common grocery store romaine. These are so fun. This is milk bok choy. I love the shape. Sometimes it's all about the shape and the color. Turnip. I got a yellow turnip. So we have white yellow, purple, and pink. Perfect. Okay, this is a Celtus. It's a green mountain winter, and it's a lettuce. This massive lettuce, grown for its large swollen stem, it's popular in Southwest China, a fall planted variety, green mountain Celtus, produces jumbo stems that remain crunchy, tender, juicy, as they reach epic proportions. This, my friends, is one you can leave on your tower and eat the leaves off of. Rarely do I say to do that. This is the one you want to do that with. If you want to keep something on your tower and just pick off of it as you go and keep it on there a long time, grow this. I am going to grow this in the bottom section of my tower so that it grows up because it's going to produce this really long, massive stem. I'm going to eat the greens off of it as it's growing, and then eventually we're going to harvest this stem, and that gives us that tasty texture meal that I had mentioned before so we can spice it up and do something unique with it. I don't know what we'll do yet, but that'll be really fun. Mustards. This is a wasa wasabina leaf. It's just a mustard. They gave me free dottle seeds. I grew dottle peppers last year. They grow amazing on the tower. They're so fun. Those were the ones, if you saw my videos and I had an umbrella of peppers over my head, they were the dottles. I ate so many dottles and then we made dottle pepper jam. So this is giant cabbage, gigantic. Like look at this thing, several feet. I am doing an experiment to see if I can grow this as leaf cabbage and if choosing this variety that has these giant genetics in it, if it produces larger leaves faster on the tower. That's why it's just to run an experiment. Can we get leaves quicker if we grow these giant varieties? Um, 
when we're growing indoors. I'll keep you posted. Dill, just standard dill. Dill grows amazing indoors. Grows better for me indoors than it does outdoors, actually. This is kale, tranchuda. It's a Portuguese kale with fleshy leaves and flavor that is more cabbage-like than other kales. So with kales, just because I've been growing kale for so long, I just like to read up different varieties and try different varieties. So this one was more cabbage-like. I've actually grown this one before and I like this one for um, like collard wraps when you're making a wrap. This is a great leaf for those, especially if you don't like collards, like the bitterness that can come with a collard leaf and you like kale better, that would be a great option. More cilantro, amaranth. This is popular in Asia, eaten raw, stir fried or steamed. Succulent leaves make a perfect spinach substitute. Spinach substitute. Ideal for midsummer. that's if you're growing outdoors. Uh, 30 to 40 day harvest, so it's quick. And just look at that gorgeous color we get to add to our meals. I wanted to see if these would make some good like steamed wraps, like um, almost like stuffed cabbage leaves, but in an Asian style recipe. And again, just color and variety to spice it up. If we're gonna eat all plants, I like to eat lots of colors, lots of shapes, lots of textures. White turnips, this is a different variety. Baker Creek has two varieties of white. Both are excellent. Um, leeks, this is the Bulgarian giant. You guys know I love to grow leeks if you've been here a while. I've got several growing in the back. Leeks are just this amazing food. Chinese cabbage, this is the late Nagasaki. I grow a lot of this. Grew amazing indoors last year. I didn't grow a lot of it over the spring um, or outdoors in the summer. I don't really know why. I think it just ran out of seeds and didn't replenish them. But this grew fantastic indoors last year, so I'm excited to get these going. Moringa. I was having amazing success with my Moringa on my towers and then they got super, super cold and most of them died because I left them outside during a frost by accident. But new Moringa seeds, it does grow on a tower and I do have them growing indoors on the towers already. Moringa is one of the most nutrient dense plants on the planet. It's a superfood. It's something many, even doctors recommend for people. Think for iron deficiency. Don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure it's iron, but great food, amazing. This is a tree, so you cannot leave this in your tower for long periods of time. We need to grow it like a bush, harvest it, and then take it out. But this is the dwarf variety, but don't let that, that doesn't mean like dwarf, that just means like instead of 15 feet tall, it may be six feet tall. It doesn't really say on here. Super food. Onion. This is an Urshikura onion. Um, great for soups and salads. Reaches enormous proportions yet remains tender and scallion-like. Never forms a bulb. So this is more like a leek type, but I believe this one grows faster than leeks. Leeks are 120 days to maturity. They are very slow. So I think I purchased this as a leek replacement and I will keep you guys posted. I'm excited about this variety. It's kind of a green onion, but bigger. It's more of that funky shaped cabbage. Probably wait until the spring for those. Um, amaranth pink beauty. Look at this plant guys. How cool is that? Heat tolerant, tender green. The greens are endlessly versatile. A powerhouse of nutrition and very heat tolerant. We don't care about that part for the summer unless you're growing outside then you might care about that part. Uh, gorgeous, and I will say that, like a lot of times people will be struggling to grow food in hot regions, and you really have to dig into your, dig into your catalogs and find things like this that say heat, very heat tolerant. These are the things you wanna be growing in your hot climates. And we may have to give up the idea of growing spinach and learn to love something really incredible like this that's a little bit different. And, and we can totally do that. I promise if you practice this concept of learning how to eat other foods outside of what we've been trained at the grocery store, it's so rewarding and it will just explode your taste buds into a whole new level. 
Um, gorgeous addition to the garden. Yeah, so I think I just thought this was really amazing. Again, we've got that texture. You can make rings. Almost reminds me of like a radish. And then you can make strips. Like if you want to saute this stem, you could cut it up into these little strips and saute them. And then you get the abundant greens and you get to eat pink food. And who doesn't want to eat pink food? So cool. Lettuce Pablo. I've grown this. I just like color. Again, this goes back to pretty foods make pretty plates. I love when you cut lettuce open and it's green, limey green on the inside, but then has those deep, rich colors on the outside. So, so pretty. More endive. I grew a lot of endive. And then our last one, which I'm kind of sad this is the last. So you'll notice a lot of these are greens. A lot of these are bok choys. Um, I have already planted my squash and my cucumbers and my tomatoes and I'm doing a whole tower of peppers and that'll be a separate video. So, and I've already got the eggplant started. So this order was mostly like the greens and the unique things to go in between, between those other foods. Celery, this is a pink Chinese celery. I have grown celery, Chinese celery in the past. Chinese celery is a whole different uh, flavor. It's very, very strong. So I have used this one where I grow it and I dehydrate it and I turn it into a powder and it's like a celery salt that we use all the time in our cooking. So I was just running low on my jar. So I thought I would try the pink variety. I haven't tried the pink, I've tried the green. Um, Bubblegum pink celery from China, easy to grow, celery variety, perfect for kids' gardens, very eye-catching for the farmer's market. There you go, easy. You can look for those keywords if you're a new gardener. Uh, something like spinach, complicated. Something like this, easy. So even regular celery can take a, quite a long time. I've got some at six weeks that's just this tall in my seedling station. It can take a really long time for celery to kind of take off. And this is one that would be easier to try. So that's it. All right, that was my seed haul. That was our catalog conversation. I hope this helps answer some questions for you and equips you to be your own gardening expert and your own seed purchasing expert.